Welcome back and happy new year. Thank you so much again for joining us also in 2023 here on SF Live. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Sort Financial Group. Again, thanks so much. We've got a great lineup of guests here in the next couple of days and weeks. We've already seen it. We've done quite a few 2022 year reviews and outlook series for 2023. We've had Jim Urio, Rick Rule. Um, we're going to have Alistair McLeod, uh, Lobo Tigre, just to name a few on the program this week, next week as well. So make sure to subscribe and hit that like button as well. I know roughly 90% of you watching these videos are not subscribed to the channel. Mind boggling. Do me a favor, hit that subscribe <laughs> button. Really, really helps us out. And really appreciate that. And YouTube picks up picks up the videos even more than they already do. So thank you so much for that. And uh, I sort of hinted at it. I have a guest here with me, of course, and it's David Morgan of the Morgan Report. David, happy New Year, and thanks so much for joining us here on the program. Well, Kai, it's great to be with you, and it's going to be nice to kick off twenty twenty three. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. It feels, it feels already like a good start to the year, looking at the gold and silver prices the last couple of days here. And to quite excited to have you on to see to get your perspective on how the market will will see things. But uh, first things first, how happy are you that silver beat gold in 2022? Well, I feel somewhat vindicated. I think for the last two or three years on my Twitter account early in the year, I would say, you know, take a poll. How many people think that silver outperformed gold this year? And I'm not sure if I did it in 2022 or not. I probably did. And, you know, of course, people who follow me follow a lot of things, but silver particularly. So most of the time it's, you know, 70, 30 or that type of thing. And this year it actually happened, even though, you know, it's nothing to write home about. I mean, gold basically did a round trip from where it started at the beginning of the year and ended at pretty much the same price, give or take some. And silver did eke out, I think it was a 4.7% gain year over year. But it moved a lot between the beginning and the end, as you well know, Kai. I mean, I could go on. It started at, I don't know, 23-ish or something. I know it hit 26 and kind of double top. And then we started to sell off. And uh, got down to 18. I said 1850 was the bottom. So I got pretty close to the bottom. And then it started this rally in the last several weeks. And it's been strong. Uh, we've gone from uh, you know up about several dollars, actually. And the inventory all year has continued to be depleted off the two main uh Leverage position exchanges, meaning the LBMA and the COMEX. So it's been an interesting ride. Yeah, you, you mentioned sort of the trade pattern last year. I have it in front of me here as well. As you said, there was that double top at 26, but then it sort of disappeared. Like, and it was quite volatile in between a couple spikes there. And uh, what was that? I'm looking at it, end of September, there were a couple sp uh, price spikes as well from the uh, like $18 range. We jumped up to $22 to, or $21. We dropped down again to $18. I was curious, like, of course, you have a really good finger on the pulse there of the silver market. What was driving the prices? Was it just the U.S. dollar and the Fed, or was there more involved than just that? Well, that's always hard to answer because, you know, you'd have to do a survey of it and ask why of every participant, you know, to get a real clear answer. But you can speak in a broad brush view. And I think it's industrial demand hasn't gone away. In fact, it's at least what it was, if not increasing, due to a push for green energy and solar especially with the energy situation coming out of Russia into Europe. So that's one part of it. The other part is the re-education of monetary history to a lot more people. When I'm referring to Wall Street, silver started roughly two years ago, and the amount of participation in that uh, arena has been tremendously big relative to when it started. So you have a group of what we call silver stackers I think they call themselves silverbacks, which is, I digress, but silverback is something you should look up and get a feel for what a silverback gorilla uh, demeanor is. And so this is added to it. So you have more retail demand, you have more or equal industrial demand, and a dwindling supply, plus supply disruptions. And what we don't talk about, and I know we will later, is what effect does the 70% of the market, which is your base metal mining, do to the silver supply? And this is something that's largely overlooked by by some. No, absolutely. You want to touch on something you mentioned in the first answer, actually, of our conversation here was the draining supply or um, stockpiles at, at the COMEX and at the LBMA, right? And why wasn't that priced in more? It's like, again, I look at the silver chart here on my left and... Uh, 
No, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense looking at it because we've been going through that narrative and you mentioned Wall Street Silver and Silver Scree sort of comes out of that as well. Stockpiles have been draining, but the price hasn't really moved. Again, we ended the year flat, fortunately, but uh, why wasn't that reflected in the price? I really can't answer that. I'm going to answer it, so I'm just <laughs> contradicting myself. But uh, there is a lag. Why is there a lag? I do not know. But what I can tell you are these facts. So from 1990 to 2005, there was a 100 million ounce deficit for 15 years in a row. And the above ground silver supply, I'm talking commercial bar supply, went from 2 billion ounces down to 500 million ounces. And that happened around 2006. But if you check the price of silver at that extremely small above ground silver supply, supply and demand, you think, well, geez, the price has got to be going up, but it wasn't. But you get five, six years, five years later from 2006 to 2011, the price went parabolic for a while. So there is this lag. And again, I can't explain why. So on that basis and how silver behaves through the last several decades, I can pretty much indicate that we're going to see another lag, which means we're going to continue to see the drain. People are going to be scratching their heads. Why is it reacting? Why is it reacting? And about the last time, the last person that gives up because it isn't moving because it should be moving sells out, then the market will take off. I mean, that's just how it works. <laughs> Not every single time, I guess. Yeah, just, uh, and that, but then it goes too parabolic too fast sometimes, right? It goes too Right, well, too that's fast. the other problem is that it really does get squeezed. Then, you know, you've got a double... Uh, situation. You've got, you know, truth or consequences. The truth is it's being drained. And the consequences are if I don't have it, I'm out of business. So you've got the industry competing with retail investors and maybe even institutional investors to buy what little remains. It's, it's, it's such a small pile. It's like the float in a stock. I mean, you might have a lot of shares outstanding, but the float is really tight. And there's only so much that will be bought or sold. Just any small buying drives the price far higher. And that's what you see in the silver market. No, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you're a veteran in the silver space, obviously. You are the, seal, uh, the silver guru. Mm. Anything that surprised you in 2022? Anything that caught you off guard or something that you learned that uh, you didn't expect uh, in the silver market? Well, a couple things, really. One was the amount of uh, imports that um, India did. And the second one was seeing the Silver Institute come out and announce there was rough round numbers, a 200 million ounce deficit in silver. So those two things were, I think, somewhat of a surprise to me. Um, there were others I'm probably, you know, not thinking about, but those two are the ones that stand out, you know, off the cuff. I think, again, where the main focus is the price. And of course, we all focus on the price. But if we look longer term at the fundamentals, then I think people that see those sometimes violent price fluctuations that really don't make sense from a fundamental basis will longer term. And I don't think the longer term is much longer. I know I sound like a broken record. I know I have my detractors. But you know, when you get to the end of the road, you're there. And I think we are at the end of the road, which means that we are going to seeing a much bigger shift from what we saw last year in 2022 in 2023, which means stocks, bonds, and real estates are persona non grata. And where do you go from there? It's pretty much the commodity sector with the top tier being the money metal. So I'm pretty bullish over this next year. Or yeah, this we'll, year. we'll get to 2023 here in a second because lots more questions in that regard, of course. I uh, want to follow up a couple things. Uh, India importing silver. Uh, for do you, do you know exactly what purpose they're importing for? Is that mostly jewelry, or are they actually industrial uses or monetary use? Pretty much monetary. I mean, there is across the board, but you know, a lot of commentators that correctly talk about India and their gold imports. But if you look back further, because of my age, the main import for monetary purposes was silver, because people were really too poor to afford gold. That's changed over the last decade or two. There's a lot more in the, what we call a middle class in India than ever before. Because of that refound wealth, they are able to purchase gold over silver. However, with the illness and all that's taken place since 2020, kind of reverting back to what's tried and true, which means silver. You got to remember in 2020, and most people don't know this, kind of, I don't think we've talked about it, but 
there was a massive amount of silver purchases by institutions, 320 million ounces. And there was also a large retail contingency, which was about 200 million ounces. There never been that much investment demand in one year for silver ever that I can recall. So where did it come from? And the answer is very wherever it was, being <laughs> smart. But a lot of it came from India because in rupee terms, silver was at an all-time high. And we were with the illness, which meant that a lot of these people were suffering just like anywhere else on the planet and needed liquidity quick. Hey, silver's high. That's what we save in. We use it for emergencies. We got to feed the kids. I got to pay the mortgage. I got to you know do whatever. Let's sell the silver. So a lot of that silver that was held for wealth protection or you know saving for a rainy day, you might say, uh, was liquidated and put into the market in 2020. Now you're seeing the reverse of that. You're seeing a lot of Indians say, I want my silver back. It's a pretty good price, and I'm going to buy it. I just looked up something real quick here, and it's uh, the duty on gold imports in India came, uh, kicked up uh, to 12.5% here in July. Um, do, do you know what the import duty is on uh, on, on silver? Is it is, yeah. the, is there one? And it has yeah, there is, it? and I, I it varies. I don't recall what it is. Okay. I won't. Okay, you. just the thought that popped into my head yeah. there. Well, well that's the other thing. I think I want to stop you there for a second and just explain that, you know, if silver were treated like gold, we'd have a different world um, because there is a, in my opinion, a strong one. There's sort of a, almost a blockage of silver investment throughout a lot of countries. I mean, there's a VAT almost on every country in Europe. So if you're going to pay 2000 bucks into the metals market and there's no VAT or a very low one in gold, and there's a 17% one on silver, then you're almost persuaded to buy gold over silver because they're both precious metals. Gold's better known, it's better advertised, and it's well known among even the establishment, whereas silver is sort of the underdog metal, but you have to pay a penalty to be able to buy it in a lot of jurisdictions. And this is something that a lot of people don't actually know unless they you know, live in that region or listen to someone you know that, that's aware of it. I, I just looked it up. Apparently, in 2020, it was also 12 and a half percent import duty. Okay. So I just Thank needed you. to check that in my in my mind yeah. here. Um, then another thing you mentioned earlier was a 200 million uh, ounce deficit that the Silver Institute mentioned. Um, and and before that, you mentioned there was a supply deficit of roughly 100 million ounces for 15 years. Yep. Right. It, it seems like it's a narrative that we're making up as silver bugs. Like I'm, I'm in the yeah, silver right. camp as well. Right. It's like okay, we're always right. It's a uh, Eventually, we're going to be right. Eventually, we're going to be right. Yeah. But uh, let, let's uh, elaborate on the 200 million ounce deficit. Like, what's their like theory based on? Like, what numbers are they looking at? What's uh, the background there? Well, I didn't really go into too much depth. I'd have to look at the article again. But the general idea is, you know, silver doesn't really care if it's being bought for monetary purposes or industrial purposes. It's being bought. And I think that's kind of the attitude we need to take. It could break it out further. But I think a couple things. One is, you know, if you go back, I have to think about it, I think around a decade and a half, China was actually a net exporter of silver of 100 million ounces a year. And roughly a decade and a half ago, they switched to being a net import of about the same amount. So that's a huge shift of 200 million ounces. No silver or gold really leaves China that's mined in their, in their country. Um, and this is true of some other countries. Now, South American countries are big providers of, you know, Mexico and Peru and Chile, Argentina. I mean, they all export their silver. And that's fine. I mean, it's their choice. But um, China in particular seems to understand the strategic viability of silver for a high-tech society. I mean, look, they make the iPhone there, or they used to. I don't know if they're moving that. But. So there's a lot to the silver world that's a subset of the technological world or the computer industry, or the semiconductor industry, or the catalysts that are used in uh, exotic uh, chemistry. There's a lot to the silver world that you know no one that buys gold even thinks about or needs to, because gold's really only purpose is uh, its function is money, yeah, and jewelry. There's not a lot else it does. Yes, it's used in some industrial applications, but not many. Whereas silver is extremely vital or absolutely imperative for so many things that take place in modern society that if we were without it, you would see a degradation in our lifestyle almost immediately. 
No, absolutely. And uh, I, I agree. Uh, photovoltaic is, is a big topic here as well. I heard uh, we're going double-sided photovoltaic uh, panels. That should be really interesting. And uh, we'll see what the efficiency there is. But you'll, you'll automatically double the need of silver or for silver uh, doing that. Um, you, you brought up China. That brings me a bit to 2023 and to time to look forward to, to the next 12 months a little bit. Uh, China sort of eased the zero COVID policy. They all, I would say, got rid of it yet. It doesn't feel like 100%, but uh, they definitely eased international travel as possible. China's opening, but we're still ahead of the Chinese New Year. Um, how much impact do you expect China to have now uh, th th this year? And when do you expect that impact to sort of come into the market? Do we have four more weeks to buy before uh, China really kicks into higher gear? I wish I knew. I'll <laughs> guess at it. I think you're about right, Kai. I think there'll be a lag and um, just have to wait and see. It's very difficult to get in the Chinese numbers and know what's valid and what isn't. We don't really know how much is warehoused. We really don't know what their true mining output is. I mean, they claim when I was there, I mean, they claim they were the number one silver producer in the world, but yet the Silver Institute and CPM group both put them usually at second or third. Um, so I don't know, but they do produce a fair amount and they're very cognizant of its value, not meaning what its price is, but the uh, inability to um, waste it. Meaning their primary question, I've said this in other interviews, the main question to me when I was there was, how do you recycle every gram? You know, once you get done with your, your solar panel, you get done, you know, photographic waste is an old story. It doesn't even apply anymore. But, you know, there's lots of, lots of electronic waste that's still putting in the landfills that contains, you know, viable metals, not just silver, but silver is one of them. Now, there is about 150 million ounces of silver recycled on an annual basis, but uh, there's also a great deal that ends up, you know, in, in the garbage heap. Oh, absolutely. Like, China is definitely one factor in 2023. Like, how much does the recession play into everything? Like, yes, silver is a monetary metal, but it's also an industrial metal. I, I, I'd weigh it personally 50-50. So how yeah. much does a recession fear sort of weigh on the silver price right now, or is it priced in already? Less than most people think, uh, and that doesn't mean I'm right, but um, we, we're going to see, in my view, and I just wrote the, the finished writing with help. I have a staff, but <laughs> the 2023 Morgan Report, and I did a kind of a bullet point almost, it was bullet points, but very succinct, said, you know, get used to the word recession. You'll hear it a lot in 23, and you'll even hear the word depression coming out of the mainstream press from time to time. And there is the best sector is going to be the commodity sector and stressing probably food and energy, the metals as well. But you're not going to see the amount of byproduct mining uh, silver production that you usually see. And here's why. We've had a breakdown in the supply chain. We've had smelters that are closed down or the prices of energy to smelt things are so high that it's not viable to smelt out $23 silver. Um, so there's this backlog of what is in the vertical integration, what step-by-step -step processes have to be accomplished in order to perform uh, or to a silver bar. And when you take that into account and understand it, there's not as much likelihood that you're going to see inputs from 70% of the market, the base metal market, copper, lead, zinc, and even gold. That will be import that will be providing now. I know the outlook from the let's say establishments differ than what I just outlined. They are saying the mining is going to increase and there'll be a bigger silver supply and that type of thing. I disagree. We'll see. And next year you can uh, quiz me and say, David, you're wrong again. <laughs> you know, there we go. But that's where I see it, and especially as people have less disposable income. Even in industries, even businesses, as the contraction of the economy continues, then it's a much more of a what do we need, not what we want kind of a pervasive idea throughout society globally. And that means, yeah, I got to eat. So food's going to be, I got to drive, which is, you know, energy. And then, you know, what do I have to have? And well, I've got to have a computer keyboard or I can't work. So I think we're going to see what I outline. We're going to see, um, a bifurcation 
going back into the commodity sector of real tangible things that are required versus uh, the paper markets, which are, you know, well, not saying the real estate market's a paper market, but it's backed by a paper market because most are mortgage. So that's what I say when I say real estate. I'm fully cognizant of it. it's a tangible asset and there's times it should do well and there will always be good real estate investments. I don't want to get too many real estate people, you know, miffed. But on the other hand, if you look at it on aggregate or you look at an REIT on the uh, New York Exchange, you're going to find out that they're going down along with stocks and bonds. No, definitely. And to, you know, I, I sort of dictated the topics here, like meaning like forecasting like China and, and, and the recession being a topic most likely in 2023. What are some other topics like that, that you think will have an impact on the silver market? You, you mentioned a couple like it, it, here is. Well, I think the crypto like, thing is crypto. Sorry to interrupt. I think the crypto thing is going to be big, and I said this before um, Bankman Fried. You know, I said that the next leg up in the crypto market will be based on tangible wealth that's associated with the blockchain. So there's several, you know, blockchain entities. I'm associated with one called Load, uh, but there's others. Uh, so that's one. But you also have them like cobalt backed. Uh, software backed. I mean, anything uh, of value. But I think this this washout is going to bring into the consciousness of the crypto world that it's just fiat on steroids if it's not tangible, meaning it's associated with something tangible. Gold, silver, cobalt, software that speed up the internet, uh, transaction service like XRP. Uh, something's re- there. There's no there there. And then I think you're going to see a lot of these altcoins that will just disappear, and they are, and you'll see more of it. So the next leg up, I think, will be led by, again, what is a tangible connection to the real world based on the blockchain. And I'm looking for gold and silver to actually lead that on the way up. I have to throw in the buzzword CBDCs here. Like, yeah, uh, and you looking at, you know, working with load there. Have there been any conversations, not just load particular, but like backing a CBDC, like a central bank digital currency with gold and silver? Is there, or at least partially? Not to my knowledge. I've actually asked that of a couple of uh, <laughs> higher ups, I'll say, um, connections that I have. And so far, the feedback I've received is no, but I don't rule it out because. First of all, to go to the reset, and that basically means a new system, which we all know what they want, which is a CBDC. You're going to say, well, wait a minute. This is no better than the system we already have, and it's worse in several ways because you're spying on it. (laughs) Everything that I purchase, you know about it. And you might even limit what the value of my money is or how much I can use or my carbon credit score is too large, cut me off from travel or whatever. And all these things are predicted that they could happen, not that they would happen. So there may be a bigger pushback on the CBDC than uh, the powers that be think. In that case, or some iteration thereof, we could see them come out, oh, wait, wait, wait. We're not putting this thing out with just tracking, tracing, (laughs) and taxing you. We're going to throw gold in the mix. And that would make it a much sweeter, you know, it's putting the cherry on top of the ice cream, or that's probably a bad analogy, but it's, it sweetens the deal that, oh, well, now we have a tangible asset of central bank digital currency that's backed by, you know, 40% gold or whatever they come up with. So I don't rule it out. I think it could happen. I mean, Jim Sinclair, and I don't want to misquote him, it's best of my understanding. It's been a while since I had a conversation with Bill Holter, but. They're going to try to float it without any backing. It's going to fail. They're going to come back with gold backing and it will succeed. I mean, that's the, the short story on it. Is that true or not? Remains to be determined. But I wouldn't take gold out entirely. I don't, you know, again, think that it'll take place without something that um, the people, you know, people want or think they want. No, interesting. Very, very interesting commentaries. David, I've got to nail you down on a silver price target for the end of the year, and then I want to talk gold for the last five minutes here. Sure. Oh, I'll just pick one. Let's get the, <laughs> all the uh, Masonic people upset. Let's say $33 an ounce. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite conservative, David. I'll take it, and uh, I'll, I'll write it down, and uh, maybe we'll compare notes at the end of the year and see uh, 
That's actually a good idea. I'll ask you. I'm interviewing Loba Tigre here later uh, to d- today as well. And uh, I'll, I'll start a table. I'll put it up online somewhere, maybe. That's not a bad idea. Um, no, David, I appreciate that. And uh, let, let's talk gold. I can't leave you or can't let you go without talking gold, at least here for a minute. Um, did, did gold do what it was supposed to do for, in your mind last year? And uh, do you think it'll continue to do that? Uh, and of course, it's not as sexy as silver to a degree, but uh, what are your two cents on that? Yeah, my gold prediction is, and gold's easier to predict than silver. And gold's primary purpose is to preserve your wealth. It did that. Of course, it is underpriced relative to the amount of paper that's been created. But uh, what I said earlier on in the year was that the run to gold has begun. And it's starting to bear out my statement, meaning that you've seen you know central banks take on more gold than they have in like 55 years. And a lot of this gold buying is done um, subtly. You know, it's not a lot of uh, family offices, central banks or whatever, you know, put it on the front page of the business section that they're buying a massive amount of gold. They've tripled their gold supply or, you know, they're sending their treasury bills for redemption and buying gold with it. But that is what's happening. So the powers that be, the central banks, the money men, they know what's coming down the road. And again, that could go back, could go back to the CBDC. So gold is really on its way. And silver is actually outperformed, as we talked about at the beginning of the interview. So I think we are finally reestablished the next leg up in this long-term secular bull market. And it's just really a good time to get involved if you have a time horizon of I'd say one to three years, five at the most. Again, I don't think the system that it now exists <clears throat> is going to last much more longer than a few years. It could, it could be wrong, but we're just seeing too much going on, especially if you look at the crypto space and uh, the amount of banks that are establishing some kind of relationship with XRP. Um, you know, I'm criticized heavily by some. Uh, that seem to know more than I do. And I'm certainly not a know-it-all, but I've tried to be a learn-it-all. And I've dove, in, dove into that uh, system. And the more feedback I get from empirical evidence, they're using it. That bank's using it. They're using it in this country, using it in that country. I mean, it's there. You can look. So I'm not a big fan of it. I have it in the portfolio. I know that uh, Ross Shields, one of their subsidiaries, owns 8%. At least that's the number that I'm given. And uh, I'm not a big fan of theirs. On the other hand, I try to be agnostic when I make picks that is this going to make you money or not. And if it politically upsets you, then certainly don't buy it. But if you're looking at my abilities to help find undervalued assets that may have um, asymmetric returns, then have a look. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm there with you as well. And uh, I think silver, I was I forgot to mention, ask earlier, like a current momentum in silver, because we're bouncing off the $24 level. We're not breaking through it. And I know I'm jumping around, but I forgot to ask that question. Do, do you see more momentum in silver now from a technical side as well? Do, do you look at yeah, the technical? Once you get the, sure. Once you get the 50-day cross into 200-day, the algorithms kick in. I mean, I think I could have read a better algorithm, but I'm trying <laughs> to be fine. But um, yeah, de- definitely. So it'll back and fill. We'll probably get a pullback or something maybe sharp and short and sharp that scares some people. But um, that's why the stackers, that's why the silverbacks are so smart because they know how to take it in stride and just keep stacking. The other thing is the premiums will come off. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, very, very high premiums paid by some people to purchase Silver Eagles as an example. And now with the 2023 new year coming out, there's always a big push for that brand new mintage date on that silver ounce. Uh, it's actually backed up the market somewhat. You've seen the premiums fall off across the board. How long that'll last, I don't know. Um, but it may continue. I just, I don't know. Um, I suspect it won't. I suspect that you'll see uh, the retail you know, market pickup in the next month or two. Uh, last thing I'd like to say is there is a seasonality that used to be very, very strong for the precious metals. And that was basically from December all the way to like early March. That did not happen for several years, but it looks like it's back. It's particularly strong in the um, the PGMs, platinum and palladium. 
you can almost guarantee, and I can't, but almost guarantee making money in Platinum Palladium in January. If you bought like mid-month of uh, December and held through January, February, I looked at the charts uh, before the interview, and it looks like um, they do what gold and silver used to do, which means platinum palladium actually go strong through January and February and into early March. So no trading advice to tell you what I'm doing. Um, but platinum has been a pretty good performer this last year, and palladium was actually negative. So my forecast to my premium service that there's a spread trade available to go long platinum and short palladium is working out fairly well. And it's a long-term spread trade. Interesting. Yeah, interesting commentary. PDAC curse will strike again, obviously, this time for platinum and palladium. PDAC always first week of March here. So that's when usually the markets turn around and uh, just weaken. It's just not a usually good time. <laughs> that's why that... that uh, term has been phrased but david thank you so much for your time it was super insightful thanks for making the effort um where can we find more of you with morganreport.com when's the next report coming out you hinted at uh, you prepared something yeah the um <clears throat> the report the paid service is the first monday of every month so it just came out i guess three january so whatever the first monday of february i'll be but in the interim i do uh video updates for paid subscribers but you don't have to be a paid subscriber. Just go to themorganreport.com and get on our free e-letter. And then there's the blog that's for free. I do a lot of interviews and post them. Occasionally, the article, we're on Substack. And I also just started an Instagram channel, trying to see if I can uh, entice, let's say, the younger crowd into learning more about the money metals. You're not dancing on there, are you? Instagram? No, no. Okay. okay. No, I'm I took checking. tango for quite some time, and I'm not that good at it. <laughs> no, you're not following any trends or so there. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, David. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. All the best for 2023, and of course, we'll catch up soon. Hope to catch you before the summer and see where things are headed here uh, on the in the silver silver space. And of course, I appreciate your insights on gold as well. But uh, we have to talk silver mostly. So everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate what you hope you enjoyed this episode. Of course, it was very silver focused. We had the silver guru himself on. So we had to talk silver and uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel. I know roughly 85 to 90 percent of you are not subscribed to this channel that are watching. Let's change that. Let's bring that number down. I really appreciate it because YouTube helps us then find more viewers as well it just goes viral at that point you know the concept and uh, we we do appreciate it. thank you so much and uh, as i said before we will have lots of more content coming out just forecasting 2023 some great guests lined up lobo tigre i'm interviewing here in the next uh, 30 minutes actually and then uh, we have alistair mcleod and many others joining us so make sure to subscribe and uh, follow the channel thank you so much we'll be back with more